I said, I'm, I'm tired. Oh, guys, I'm tired. This is the second time the network is cutting off like that. I am... Okay. I'm going to run from the beginning to the end just so we can save the life of Hebrews chapter 9. Ah! Oh, man, wow. Okay, I'm going to run from, from, from top, from verse 1 to 12, it was from 12, I said they're reading from the message from TPT. I'm gonna start from verse one to 12, no problem. Just so we can save, save the life. I want to be able to save this. If I, if I continue from verse 12, where, where it went off, we'll not be able to save it. So I'll start from verse, from verse one again. Those of you who joined late, um, the second half, this may be for you. Oh boy, Jesus. Just so indeed, even the first covenant had ordinances of divine service and earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was prepared, the first part in which was the lampstand, the table, um, and the shoe bread, which is called sanctuary, and behind the second veil, the part of the tab tabernacle which is called the holiest of all which had the gold incensor and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid on all sides with gold, in which were the gold in port, and that had the manna, Aaron's rod that bore it. These were all in the, in the earthly sanctuary. Verse, um, and tables of covenant. Verse 5, And above it were the cherubims of glory overshadowing the mercy seat of these things. We can now speak in details. Glory to God. Verse 6, now, when these things had been thus prepared, the priest also went into the first part of the tabernacle performing the services. But into the second part, the high priest went alone once a year, not without blood, with which he offered for himself for the people's sin committed in ignorance. Glory to God. The Holy Spirit indicating this, that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest while the first tabernacle was still standing. It was symbolic for the present time in which both gifts sacrifices are offered, which cannot make him who performed the service perfect in regards to conscience, concerned only with the foods and drinks, various washing, fleshly ordinances imposed unto the time of reformation. Verse 11, but Christ became a high priest of the good things to come with the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is not of the creation. Verse 12, watch verse 12. Verse 12 is where I was going to. Not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, he entered the most holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. You see, eternal redemption. So we, we read in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, eternal salvation. We read in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9, eternal salvation. The eternal redemption in Hebrews chapter um Chapter 9, verse 12, is the same message the explaining the eternality of the work of Christ. Explaining the eternality of the work of Christ. So if you read verse 12 in the Passion Translation, verse 12 of Hebrews chapter 9 that we are in, verse 12, it says, And, and he has entered once and forever into the holiest sanctuary, of all not with the blood of animal sacrifices but the sacred blood of his own sacrifice and he alone has made our salvation so that redemption that was mentioned there is actually salvation is all together he alone has made our salvation secure forever he has paid the ransom redemption forever 
That is what you have there. He has paid the ransom redemption forever. He alone has made our salvation secure forever. So salvation, so when people talk about we preach eternal salvation, I'm like, he, are you joking? Are, are, you, are you serious? The key word there is forever. The key word there is forever. When people may say that statement, uh, uh, you know, why are you people preaching eternal salvation? Is are you people, are you people serious? My salvation is secured forever. It's in scripture. Can you see verse twelve? He has entered once and forever into the holiest sanctuary of all. Not with the blood of animal sacrifice, the Passion Translation, verse 12, but, he, but the sacred blood of his own sacrifice. And he alone has made our salvation secure forever. He alone, not with our efforts, not with our efforts, secured eternally. So what are you talking about? What are you talking about? When people try to tell you, you know, his eternal salvation is a message from the pit of hell. Are you joking? What you're saying is that the word of God is from the pit of hell in the epistles. He alone has made our salvation secured forever. do that he alone has made he did it alone made our salvation secured forever secured forever yeah, yeah, yeah. secured forever you see that clearly in scripture glory to God I'm going to read TPT to verse 14 and I'll continue 13 under the old covenant the blood of bulls and goats and ashes uh, ashes of a heifer were sprinkled on those who were defiled and effectively cleansed them outwardly from their ceremonial impurities. Can you see that? So I'm reading verse 13, Passion Translation. It says, And the old covenant, the blood of bulls and goats and ashes of heifer were sprinkled on those who were defiled and effectively cleansed them outwardly from their ceremonial impurities. Verse 14, yet how much more will the sacred blood of the Messiah thoroughly cleanse our conscience? For by the power of the eternal spirit, he has offered himself to God as the perfect sacrifice that now free us from dead works to worship and serve the living God. Glory to God. Let me see verse 12 in the in the in the new living translation just so we understand that eternality of the finished work with his own blood not the blood of goats and calves he entered the most holy place once for all time and secured our redemption forever so salvation is secured forever forever ever forever eternally secured forever 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 eternally secured forever 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 we are eternally secured glory to god eternally secured glory to god glory to god glory to god glory to god amen let's go back to i uh, read verse 15 from the new king james version as we raise to a close glory to god and for this reason he's the mediator of the new covenant yeah by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant and those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance so he secured our redemption forever and you see in verse 15 it explains that verse 15 is one of the ways i know that this thing was not written by apostle paul uh, and this is the reason he's the mediator of the new covenant by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions under the first covenant and those who are called may receive the promise of eternal inheritance. 
verse 15 is one of the ways I know that this book was not written by Apostle Paul. Paul won't write like that. Paul won't write like that. Who knows what he just did in verse 15? Let me find out if, if you guys are sensitive enough to know what the writer did in verse 15. Anybody knows? Okay, I'll leave it. Verse 16. For where there is a statement, it, sorry, where there is a testament, there must also be a necessity um, be the death of the testator. This is why we say Matthew, Mark, Luke, John cannot be New Testament because until the testator dies, the testament is not active. You see what I mean? Until the testator dies, the testament is not active. Verse 17. For a testament is in force after men are dead since it has no power at all while the testator leaves. You see that? While the, while the testator leaves. Therefore, Therefore, not even the first covenant, referring to the old covenant and law. Okay, I'll explain verse 15 later. I'll explain verse 15 later. Let's, let's, let me just finish. Remind me to explain verse 15 later. Therefore, not even the first covenant was dedicated without blood. For when Moses had spoken every precept, precept to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of the calves and goats, with water, sacred wool, and high soap, and sprinkled both the both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the blood of the new covenant which God has commanded you. Then likewise he sprinkled the blood, both the tabernacle and all the vessels of the ministry. And according to the law, almost all things are purified with blood, not and without shedding of blood, there is no remission of sins. In, in B15, he's making a case for the Gentiles as well. No, what are you saying? You, you almost got the reason why I think why um, verse 15 cannot be Apostle Paul. But you didn't, you didn't, you didn't, you didn't see it well. It didn't sit well. So I'm going to do verse 12 again down. You see it properly. So verse 12 talks about eternal redemption. What I love about the writer of the book of Hebrews, he agrees on eternal redemption, eternal salvation, etern the eternality of the work of Christ is in Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9, is in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12. Hebrews chapter 5 verse 9, Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12, you see the eternality of the work of Christ. Hebrews 5 verse 9 and Hebrews 9 verse 12, you will see clearly the eternality of the work of Christ. But there's a reason I'm saying that the writer was not Apostle Paul. Verse 15 reveals it. You are close to it, but I explained. I just want to go through this first. Um, and then you see, um, you see clearly why I believe that. Because and, um, it, it, will, it will make sense to you. Eternal salvation and eternal redemption. So when people talk about uh, eternal salvation is such a dangerous message. We found it in scripture. We didn't create it. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12. Read it in the Passion Translation. Read it in the Message Translation. Read it in many translations. You see it clearly. It speaks about the eternality of the work of Christ. He alone has secured our salvation forever. Not, not both of us. So when I talk about locked up in Christ, I know what I'm talking about. But I know that when lie has stayed so much in the mind, truth becomes religion. Truth becomes rebellion. When lie stays so much in a place, Truth becomes rebellion. So when we preach, we say, who are these boys preaching grace, grace, grace? We found it in scripture. We didn't create it. And that's the message we're giving to preach and teach. Glory to God. Glory to God. So I'm going to read verse 23 to verse 28. And then we'll discuss verse 12 and verse 15 again. Because you see, it's such a dangerous message. Uh -uh. I don't understand. When you say something, I'm like, didn't you see it in the Bible? What God told us to preach, you say is dangerous. I like the dangerosity of the grace of God. It dangerously frees men from ignorance. It dangerously frees men from captivity. It dangerously liberates men from the shackles of the law. Glory to God. For, let me read from, from verse 23 to 28. Then we will discuss verse 12 again and discuss verse 15. Deal? I just want to go through this. Amen. 
Amen. Therefore, it was necessary that the copies of the things in the heavens should be purified with this. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than this. Glory to God. Verse 24. For Christ has not entered the holy place made with hands, which are copies of the true, but into heaven itself, now to appear in the presence of God for us. Let me explain verse 24. You know what, you know the time where Jesus resurrected and Jesus saw me, is it Mary Magdala who wanted to touch Jesus? And then Jesus said, hey, don't touch me for I have not gone to my father. I have not gone to my father. People say, ah, it's because Mary was in her period. That's why um, Jesus said, don't touch me. Why are you joking? No, because he had to present the sacrifice to heaven. That's why he did that. It was after he did that, he even told Judas, touch my side and touch my hand. He had done that before Judas touched his side and touched his hands. You know, clearly. Verse 25. Not that he should offer himself often as a high priest enters the most holy place every year with blood of another. Every year with blood of another. Next, verse 26. And then would have had to suffer often since the foundations of the world, but now once at the end of the ages he prepared, he has prepared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. Are you seeing this? So the sacrifice of Jesus is once and for all. This is why I said the blood of Jesus was shed once for all time, once for all men, once for all sins. Get it? The blood of Jesus was shed once for all time, once for all men, once for all sins. One more time, the blood of Jesus was shed once for all time, once for all men, once for all sins. So some of you stop imagining in your mind that the blood is still flowing on the street. The blood is speaking. It's no longer flowing. The blood was shed once for all time, once for all men, and once for all sins. And I understand that in the animation of your of the African magic of your mind, you just feel like, oh, the blood is flowing. I soak my car with the blood of Jesus. I soak the road with the blood. Just stop, stop, stop. The blood of Jesus speaks. For we have the blood of Jesus that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. You hear me what I'm saying? Blood of Jesus that speaketh better things than the blood of Abel. It is still speaking. It is still speaking. It is not flowing. It is still speaking. It still has miraculous power, miraculous effect, but it's not something that flows. It's something that speaks. It is the life of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Uh, and then would have had to suffer often since the foundation of the world but now once at the end of the ages he has prepared to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself verse 27 and as it is appointed for men once to die after that the judgment are you seeing that and he's appointed unto men once to die after that the judgment he has died our debt and he has taken our judgment and so the believer's judgment is not in front of him the believer's judgment is behind him glory to god you hear what i said he has died our death and he has taken away our judgment so the believer's judgment is not in front of him the believer's judgment is behind him the believer's judgment is behind him because he took my judgment he took my death he took my judgment and took my death. Glory to God. Glory to God. And it's appointed um, for men wants to die. But after this, the judgment. The believer's judgment is not behind, is not in front of him, it's behind him because Jesus already took my judgment. So all those judgment day is coming. Judgment day, all men shall stand before the throne of God and give account of my darling Jesus. When the water set on fire, you let me tell you the truth. Don't sing it with fear. Guess what? The Bible says love is made perfect on the day that he shows up because as he is so are we in this world we're not afraid of judgment because he's taking away our judgment our judgment is a judgment of reward 
reward is going to reward our good works reward how we behaved because guess what the judgment of the believer is not in front of him god is not about to judge you we're not looking ahead for judgment we're looking ahead for reward glory to god glory to god we're not looking ahead for judgment we're looking ahead for reward because the reward of the believer is in front of him the judgment of the believer is behind him the reward of the believer is in front of him when we see jesus we will be rewarded that is our judgment but the judgment judgment of the believer has been taken away because Jesus took our judgment and there cannot be double jeopardy. He took my script. He wrote my exams. I passed. He gave me the certificate to show up before God. All my sins are forgiven. Glory to God. 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 Verse 28. Very powerful. So Christ was offered once to bear the sins of many. To those who eagerly wait for him, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to see salvation. You see that? So when Jesus comes again, he's not coming for the believer to, to record your sin. He's coming for salvation. He's coming for salvation because he has taken your judgment once and for all because he's the payment of your sin already. So when he comes again, he's not coming to look for sin. He's coming to look for salvation. Glory to God. Let me read verse 28 in the Passion Translation. Maybe you will love it. Passion Translation says, But when we die, we'll, face, uh, we'll be face to face with Christ, the one who experienced death once and for all, to bear the sins of many. But now to those who eagerly wait, await him, he will appear a second time, not to deal with sin, but to bring us to the fullness of salvation. Did you see that? What is the fullness of salvation that he's talking about here? Your body. Because your spirit is saved. Your soul is being saved. But isn't it your body is not saved? So he says when he comes, he was, he's coming to bring us to the fullness of salvation. Spirit, soul, and body saved. Your spirit is saved. Your soul is being saved. How is your spirit saved? The Bible says the spirit of God bears witness with our spirit that we are children of God. How is your soul being saved? Taking out the engrafted word of God that is about to save your soul. Be not confirmed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of the word. But your body is not saved. So he's coming to bring us into the fullness of salvation. He's not coming to take record of our sins. You see, I've been watching you from heaven. I don't come punish you. No, that's not how God behaves. That he don't do like that. You see that? Glory to God. Let me see. That's typically the fullness of salvation. Let me check uh, message, the last verse. Glory to God. Everyone has to die once, then face the consequences. Christ died. Christ's death was also a one-time event, but it was, an, it was a sacrifice that took care of sins forever. So and so, when the next... When he next appears, the outcome for those eager to greet him is precisely salvation. Salvation. Let me try the New Living Translation, NLT. NLT says, So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many. You see what I say? Once for all time, once for all men, once for all sins. So also Christ was offered once for all time to take time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many people. He will come again not to deal with our sins. 28, New Living Translation. So also Christ was offered once for all time as a sacrifice to take away the sins of many. He will come again not to deal with our sins because he has dealt with it on the cross but to bring salvation to all who eagerly waiting for him when jesus comes again is not for punishment of your sins it's coming for full experience of salvation glory to god so let's discuss verse 12 again and verse um verse 15 and then we can close verse 12 says i love verse 12 verse 12 stand is you know it's, it's important for me verse 12 here it says and he has entered is eternal yeah 
and he has entered once and forever into the holiest sanctuary of all, not with the blood of animal sacrifices, but with the sacred blood of his own sacrifice. And he alone has made our salvation secured forever. That's perfect. It's made our salvation secured forever. So let's discuss verse 15. Is um, Becky still here? Um, let's discuss verse 15 again. Can you put verse 15 in the King James Version? I'm reading New King James here. Put verse 15 in the King James Version. Is this TPT? I'm reading. Yes, this TPT. Let me read verse 15 TPT. So Jesus is the one who has entered a new covenant um, with a new relationship with God so that those who accept the invitation will receive eternal inheritance. And he has promised to his heirs, for he died to release us from the guilt of of the violations committed under the first covenant. Okay. Can you put King James here? Can you put King James here? Let me see if I can do this. A M P C A M P C A M P C I'm almost done. This is for Christ. Christ the Messiah is therefore the negotiator and mediator of an, of an entire new agreement, testament, covenant, so that those who are called and offered and offered it may receive the fulfillment of the promise everlasting inheritance. Since his death has taken place with rescues and delivers the redeem delivers and redeems them from the transgression committed under the old first agreement. Let me explain to you. Maybe you get, I'm sure you get it. It's really quite simple um, if you open your mind to it. So the writer of the book of Hebrews, when he got to verse 15, he removed the Gentiles from that place. For this is the cause, is the merit of the, of the new covenant and by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the first testament, they which are called you see, so when he did, if it's Apostle Paul, let me just give you the the, 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 the the gist. If it's Apostle Paul, he will say things like, for the redemption of those who were under the first government Jews and those who were not under the, the that first um, um, covenant Gentiles. When Apostle Paul speaks, he will add Jews and Gentiles. When the writer spoke in Hebrews chapter 9 verse 15, he removed us from that forgiveness because he was talking to Jews only. He didn't do that to remove us, disenfranchise us from the um, salvation of God in Christ. I, 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 don't, I don't believe that. Because he was talking to Jews strictly, he spoke to Jews strictly. If it was Apostle Paul, he would have said for the redemption of those who were under the first covenant and those who were not under the first covenant. Because you and I were not under the first covenant. The covenant was written to Jews, not Gentiles. We broke the party. We, we get crashed the party. So if it was Apostle Paul, he would have added for those who were under the first covenant and those who were not under the first covenant have now received redemption. But because he's not Apostle Paul, I hope you get this. I hope you get this. Oh, the numbers have dropped. It's fine. I hope you get this. I hope you get this. Because he's not Apostle Paul who wrote this strongly, he just spoke to the Jews only in the first covenant. One of the ways it's not, I mean, I could tell that no. Apostle Paul won't write like that. Every time Apostle Paul wrote, he will write about the Jews, but he will use that to say Gentiles has been invited to. So the, the law was not written to Gentiles. We crashed the party. It did not consign us at all. We have no business obeying the law. It was not written to us. No business obeying the law. It was not written to us. We crashed the party. You see what I mean? We crashed the party. No business with the law. So when he wrote in verse 15, he wrote and by this reason they've, re they've received redemption those who were under the first covenant. But if it was Paul, he would say those who were under the first covenant and those who were outside the covenant too. Glory to God. 
Well, you learned something today. I hope you did. Every morning Bible study is beautiful. I hope you did. Guys, grace and peace multiply to you. I'm going to be at the mainland church today. Continue the series I started last week. The devil is a liar. The devil is a liar. I'm going to continue today. God has a word that will bless, change your life completely. The devil is a liar. You're going to enjoy it. So tomorrow morning, I'm here for 9 o'clock uh, to share God's word with you. We're going to be reading Hebrews chapter 10 tomorrow morning by God's grace. Uh, Hebrews chapter 10. Then on Sunday morning, we continue the series. We started on Sunday, cross position. It will bless you. It will bless you. Never forget, God loves you more than the devil hates you. Thank you for all the congratulation messages. Thank you so much. I appreciate you. I love you all. I love you all. I love you all. God's blessings on you and your household. In Jesus' matchless name, amen.